what we're covering tonight is data screening. Okay. And very specifically, I want to give you a demonstration of data screening specific to structural equation modeling. So there are a bunch of different ways to do data screening. There are a bunch of opinions about this, and I have plenty. Um, but what we're going to do is just kind of focus on the main core components that one really needs for large data sets, right? Because most SIM models are pretty large. Okay. So there are four key steps to this. Accuracy, dealing with errors in the data set. And this is true of any, any analysis, right? So garbage in, garbage out. We've got to make sure that we have the data we think we do. Uh, missing data, so how do I deal with holes in the data set and when can I impute those and when shouldn't I update those? Outliers, determining are there outliers and what to do with them. And then the assumptions checks. So within that, there's five. So additivity, we'll do linearity, normality, homogeneity, and homoscedasticity. Sounds like a lot, but they're pretty easy to get. And the type of data screening here, this kind of four-step procedure, it's usually the last step that changes based on the type of data I have. So if I have ordinal data, so it's, you know, if you decide that you don't think Likert scales, those one to five strongly agree to strongly disagree scales are ordinal, because they kind of are, instead of interval, then you wouldn't really need to check for um, some of these linearity and normality assumptions, but you're probably also doing a different type of analysis, which we'll cover at the very end of the semester. So I'm going to give you the kind of general rules and know that we may tweak them based on what analysis we're doing. Okay. Um, but focus normally in SIM models is on traditional parametric assumptions because structural equation modeling is regression on steroids. So we're doing the assumptions that are required for regression. And generally, um, oh, I thought that would render the alpha. My LaTeX is not working, but that's OK. It can be in italics. So generally, we set some sort of alpha value when we're conducting a statistical analysis. And this is the rate at which we're accepting a type 1 error. Very famously, this is sort of that traditional statistical significance line where things um, become magical, the land of P less than 0.05, right? Where we say things are significant, which implies important. Okay? I would disagree, but you know, given all the talk about numbers today, um, I will say that this has sort of been a weird week to be a, a, a numbers person because watching all the election results and being like, why does everyone have a different set of numbers? <laughs> like, whose numbers are real, right? Um, and that's how I feel about this whole idea of, of statistical significance, right? It's this magic line in the sand where on one side it's um, not important, on the other side it is, right? So I always advocate effect sizes when I'm doing uh, normal stats. Now on SIM, we're mostly going to ignore p-values, but for data screening, they still have their, their purpose, okay? And we want to make sure that things are really bad, really unusual, before we correct or eliminate, in the case of outliers. And so we're going to set our criterion to be lower. And we're still going to use P less than alpha, but now we're going to lower alpha down, usually to 0 0.001. Because you want things to be really strange before you start tweaking. Okay. And then in our case, that's only going to affect um, outliers. If you were doing like a traditional ANOVA, that might affect Levine's test. So there are some tests on tests. <laughs> uh, but here, we're only going to use this criterion for outliers. So we want to just make sure that they're really, really out there before we get rid of them. And so the order that we're going to do this in is also important. Okay, so this can be performed in many different ways. And they're all right in their own forms. But it's important that you fix the errors first and then the missing data. Because if you have an error that you don't know what it is, it becomes missing data. And missing data is, needs to be fixed before you test it as an outlier. Because if it's missing, it doesn't get included in that outlier analysis. Okay. And then outliers have a strong impact on assumptions. So they're, they're ordered in this sort of four-step procedure 
um, on purpose because each one sequentially affects the next one. Okay, So the changes you make affect the next steps. And so we're just going to do an example because the best way to learn here is to do. And I'm going to explain how to read these outputs and how to run these outputs as I go. Okay. So <clears throat> this particular example is made up data. Okay, So these are experiments that I have run before um, doing some cognitive science research, but the data itself is made up. Okay. And we ask people to judge their own learning. Okay. And so this is a really common task. So you give some people some information and you say, you know what, if I give you a quiz on this, how well do you think you do on that quiz? And they give you a judgment. Those judgments are very biased, usually upwardly biased. So people who underperform, who do not do very well, tend to overestimate their skills. Okay? And then people who under, who overperform, who do really well, tend to underestimate their skills. Sometimes it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Okay? And it's very famous. Um, there's a lot of research on why people are like this. And I think um, we can see these effects in our daily life Right, time, estimating time, how long it's going to take you, take you to do something. I'm particularly bad at this, even though I've researched this. Um, you know, estimating all kinds of things. We're just not very good at it. Okay. And so we're trying to figure out how do we make them better. Right. And then they also rated their confidence. So um, not only did we ask them to judge how well they think they remember, we asked them sort of like, how confident are you that you're going to remember this? And then we measure their actual memory. So recall. So you can kind of correlate confidence and recall, and you can see if, you know, if people are attuned to how well they're going to do. And so I'm going to use the Rio library to import this. I had a, a friend introduce me to this library. If you've never used it, it is magic. <laughs> I cannot say enough good things about Rio um, because it's one function, import, and you can feed it almost every type of data possible and it interprets the data type and then uses the right function to import it so csv it might use read csv right if it's an spss data file it's going to use um, haven to read that if it's an excel file i think it uses um, xlsx file um, to read that so it's like a, a wrapper around all these different data types and it's so magic because all you have to remember is import, <laughs> and then it it, um, it will read them in. Yes, it is super nice. Like I said, I cannot say enough good things about Rio. Uh, Rio package data types. They have a, a kind of a vignette, yeah, that explains all the different formats. And you're like, oh, okay, that's cool. And then it just keeps going and going and going. It's beautiful. It's, it's wonderfully beautiful. Um, I don't think it does PDFs. PDFs are, are um, a pain. So I'm going to put this on YouTube. They're a pain. And for that, I have always had to set up the extra like PDF thing because of the XML that is underneath PDFs and Word docs. Um, if you remind me at the end, I can probably look up what package I'm using, but you've probably done something similar. It is like the one thing that they don't have. But it will read JSON and HTML, uh, maybe a little bit of XML, which is what a Word doc is. <clears throat> so now that I have Major Night with Rio, <laughs> let's look at the data. Um, so it's got two categorical columns here uh, of what group they were in and what type of cue we gave them. So we, we were trying to see if, if we made them make this judgment quickly, were they better if we made them delay? Like, oh, I've forgotten all these things now. And then just 10 scores. Confidence. How confident are you? You're going you're gonna to do well in this test. And how well did you actually remember the information? So with accuracy checks, you have to know the data. And once you get to your own data, this is easier. For the data sets we're going to use, I'm going to tell you what the accuracy should be. Um, but in your own data sets, summary and table are kind of the best two. And it, it used to be um, in R3, read CSV, uh, use 
strings as factors was the default was true. And so the summary function worked pretty well because all of the character vector variables became factors. That was a pain in other ways. So now I would just recommend people use table for those, uh, ca uh, ca not categorical, character vectors. And so with categorical data, the assumption check is, are the labels right? Should this variable be, actually be a factor for maybe ggplot or ANOVA or whatever? Um, for our sim modeling, it works pretty well either way, as a character or as a factor. For continuous data, the question becomes, um, is the range of the data correct? Right. So do we have any weird scoring going on? And we're going to talk a lot about scales and scale development and kind of um, good survey design. And one thing that happens to a lot of people is they might have a reverse coded item. You know, that's kind of the opposite direction of the rest of them. This is really where you need to fix that item. Okay, so you rescore it. Or in the case of, um, let's say you're using Qualtrics. Okay. Every once in a while, Qualtrics has a mind of its own <clears throat> and will stick, you know, an item that should be one to seven as like nine through 15. Okay. And you're just like, what, why? And so this always helps me just make sure that the numbers I'm expecting are actually what I got. Okay. And so let's look at that. Okay. So I could just run summary but I paused on that. I just want to start with categorical data. Okay. And these look pretty good. Okay. Um, if you've done the intro to R assignment, that's, I think, actually real data um, um, in the, the typing stuff. And uh, those are real things that people typed. So when they typed left, what hand are you, left or right, they <laughs> typed all kinds of crazy stuff. So you might have to like make those all be the same. Or in our case, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clean them up. So if I decide to make a graph, they're at least pretty. Okay, just to show you how to do this. Okay. And so the, the function I'm going to use um, is factor here. Okay, I was trying to see if I can make this bigger. There we go. Um, the factor function just creates that from a character vector into a special type called a factor. And those are really handy, especially in ggplot. If you're going to make pictures, it really wants factored variables. Okay. And here's another habit I picked up a long time ago using SPSS, but I have a, a, the original data set, which, you know, too much GitHub, it's the master branch, right? And I'm going to save this new data set as no typos. So then I'm going to go through and fix the typos. Okay. Now in R, there's not really a reason to keep separate data frames, right? If they're super huge, maybe don't do this. But I like to have them both in my environment at the same time, because if I mess up, I can just back up to the original, you know, this step. But I also can compare. So I can say, okay, in the master data set, make a table. In the no typos data set, make a table. Okay, I can see what I did. And that just allows me to kind of keep track of what's happened in each step. That's because I'm usually writing scientific reports, like this many rows were lost due to missing, this many rows were lost due to this, and that just helps me know what happened. Okay. Um, all right, so if you've never used a factor command, what happens? First um, argument is the column you want to use, so it needs to be a single column of, or vector of data. Okay. So I'm going to use the JOL group column. Okay. The levels as currently written in the, um, in the column. So you need to spell them exactly the same. Okay. So delayed versus immediate here, you got to spell them delayed versus immediate. You could reorder them, but if you don't spell them the same, it will wipe them out. They will be gone forever. <laughs> and that's when you back up and fix your typo. Okay. So levels here is exactly how it appears currently in the data set. If you want to drop one, don't include it. It'll become an NA value. Labels is the new version, so it's what we're going to stick on top. All I did here was capitalize, but I just wanted to show you how to factor um, because this um, becomes useful if you need to kind of recreate some prettier labels. <clears throat> For continuous data, the confidence and recall scores should only be 0 to 100, and this is made of data, so I made some of them too big. 
and we do have some data to clean up. So I did this just a summary function. And now that these variables are factors, they print nicely. If they're characters, they don't print it, just as character. And so I'm just like go through and scan. Confidence one, this looks good. You know, it's got a couple of missing data points we'll deal with in a little bit. Confidence two, oops, confidence four, here is a negative value. And so some of them are over 100 as well. Now, why do these things happen? Well, in this case, it's because I forced them to happen. But what might have happened is when we're having people type their confidence levels, maybe they just accidentally hit 4, 7, and then 0. Okay. That's too many, too many numbers, right? It's out of range. And a good survey design wouldn't allow them to move on, but this is an example. Um, why else might data be bad? Well, because you imported it incorrectly. Um, you know, you think the scale is supposed to be one to seven and someone coded it as zero to six. And so this just really is a great, like quick, okay, these are the numbers I'm expecting, um, check. And so instead of fixing these each one at a time with categorical variables, <clears throat> you often have to fix them one at a time, unless they're all have the same rules. But with continuous data, um, and they all have the same rule, I can fix them all at once. So that's kind of nice. And there are probably um, many other ways to do this. This is just the way I've learned it. And so if you have some other ways, I'm happy um, to add them to as examples. But um, for what I tend to do is find first what the columns are. You can reference, this as part of slicing, right, or subsetting, specific columns. I'm, um, I'm going to use base R here mostly. And so I know it's column 3 through 22. Okay. Because it's 1 and 2 are these categorical variables, and then everything else 3 to the end is 22. Okay. I also really love the names function. That's probably the thing I type the most. Um, names, data frame. It gives me all the column names. And so that's where I got 3 through 22. Those are the columns I want to fix. Do them all at once. Okay. So you do that. So this would be just like if I were you know, dropping the first two columns. And then the second thing you do in these square brackets here is you put in the rule. So the rule here is anything greater than 100 is bad. And we want to fix it. And so what this kind of combination of data frame and then square brackets rule does is it looks through all of the rows and columns that you've listed and finds the things that don't meet the rule. Okay. So here it does also find NAs. So I wanted to print that out. So it is fine, you know, if it, if it doesn't meet the rule, um, if it is an NA, it's like a special circumstance. And so it will print them out for you. But then it also shows you the two values over 100. Okay. Now this doesn't show you where, but it's, I just wanted you to kind of see what this funk, what this uh, line of code is doing. Why is the area before the comma empty? Great question. So here, in both cases. So for slicing rules in R, it's rows, comma, columns. I want all rows, so I leave it empty. And then I only want columns 3 through 22. Okay. That answer it. Great. <clears throat> no problem. Um, you could also type the names in the columns. They're like actual names. Uh, and that's useful when you're not sure what order the columns are going to be in. But it's, it can get tedious. It can be quite long. Okay. Uh, and then there's some other tricks as well. I like to use, um, uh, if the column names are, 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 have a pattern, like I know my column names are conf number, rec, uh, rec number, you can use some regular expressions to grab only specific columns. Uh, but this, this will work pretty well for you until you change the order of the columns. <laughs> and then you got to fix this line here. Okay. All right, this just shows you what's wrong. Let's actually fix it. So I just wanted you to kind of see what, what it's doing. It's finding it's finding the NA values, that's okay, but it also finds us the wrong values. 
if you happen to know what that value should be, because you have the original data set, you have the original participant forms, whatever, you can fix it. So you can make it whatever it's supposed to be. I don't know what that value is supposed to be because participants don't follow the rules sometimes, so I'm going to make that missing data. And so I'm just going to set all of those values to NA because what, what do they mean to type? That value is not valid. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing, but the lower half. So the first one got everything above 100. Now I'm going to grab everything below 100. And then if you aren't sure if it worked, you can rerun the summary function and just look at those values. Okay. Um, and you'll see a couple more NAs, and then the value should be correct. I did not do that because it's quite long, but that's what I do when I'm checking for myself. Now that created new missing data, so that's why accuracy has to go first. Because now I have a couple more missing data points because I'm not sure what the participants intended to type. And so there are two key types of missing data. Missing not at random, or MNAR, and that's when the data is missing because of some specific cause. Okay, like everyone skipped question five. Or like my stupid self, which has uh, program surveys and left entire questions off. That's not random, that's my fault. <laughs> um, or a coding error. So those are, those are data points that we don't want to replace because they're not accidental. And then there's missing completely at random, I left a word out here, completely at random or mcar, and that's just data that's like an accident basically. So computer error like um, the internet froze right at that moment so you lost a couple of questions um, or if you're uh, clicking through a survey too quickly and you just skipped a question that's really common so we're going to try to find in car missing at random data and replace that if we can and we also have to really think about the distinction between missing data and incomplete data so by incomplete data, I mean things where the per they got bored and they quit halfway through. Okay. I am in the psychological sciences. This is incredibly normal. People just like, ugh, enough of this. Right? If you are working at a job um, where you do feedback surveys, this is why you keep them short. Because people don't want to sit there and answer a bunch of questions. Okay. So you have like 15 seconds to keep their attention, right? So that data is not really missing. It's incomplete. And I tend to tell people to exclude incomplete data, unless they just skipped like one item. Okay. Because incomplete data is not random either. Okay. Alright, so I've started a new step, so I'm just going to save a new data frame. Okay. And um, this also just helps me keep track of where I'm at when I'm doing this. And so a summary of the missing data. We can see we've got a couple data points here and there. A couple more towards the end of the survey so you'll usually see that missing data points increase towards the end and this is why randomization is a good thing but you can also tell that all of our max values over 100 went away so we did fix that problem so there's a whole lot of missing options so a lot of people for a long time suggested you should do mean substitution we really shouldn't do that anymore. We also have computer programs that are much more savvy at handling um, imputation types analyses. Uh, there are, you know, machine learning algorithms that do this kind of stuff. What we're going to do is use the MICE package. Okay, um, it's a multiple imputation chained equations is what MICE stands for, and it's really great and super easy. So bonus times two. But where? I can't just like feed it my whole data frame. You could, but you shouldn't. <laughs> um, because then the data becomes kind of garbage. Okay. And so where is the missing data? Okay. And there are some cool packages that'll that'll um, do some visualization of this, but I just it, then it doesn't help me break apart the data set. So I always um, just kind of work through breaking apart the data set. So think about data sets as like Legos. And um, when you put them together, right, they kind of have parts and pieces. So what we're going to do is take our data frame and break it into smaller chunks. Okay? 
the first way we're going to split our data frame is by rows. And so I'm going to find all of my incomplete data points because those are not at random. And I'm going to exclude people that I that are kind of incomplete and I can't really do a whole lot with their data. So I wrote myself a percent missing function because this is something that R doesn't really have. Oh, this is just sum. That is a big old typo. Um, let us fix that bad boy. Whew. While we're at it. This should say completely. There we go. All right. So I, I was saying earlier, I've done this like a thousand times, but I um, definitely messed that up right there. Okay. So this should say it's the sum of all the missing values. So how many missing values are there divided by the length? Okay, to get a percent, we also need to multiply it by 100. Who I was not caffeinated well enough right there. So let's go ahead and fix that. Cool. Where was the French director? Rose. All right. That looks a lot better. Okay, so we've got our missing function. And um, I'm going to use the apply function. I remember when I first started R and I thought apply, like it just consternated me. I do not know why it was like brain surgery, but now I do love apply. So apply is kind of like a loop function. If you are um, familiar with languages that use more loops, like Python. Uh, and so what you do is you put in the data frame you're interested in. So it's got to be at least a data frame. It won't work on like a single vector of data. A number, it's either one or two. One for rows, two for columns. So we're going to start with rows, so one. And then our function here. So this percent missing function is um, just going to calculate how much data is missing. And that's really cool because it's flexible. It doesn't matter how many columns I put into, I'm sorry, this is yeah, how many columns? Because we're calculating by row. So for each row, calculate them percent missing. So if the data frame has 100 columns, it'll deal with it. If it has four columns, it'll deal with it. And then I just calculated a table of this just to see where what is the missing data. And so I have 139 participants who have no missing data. I have 15 participants who have approximately 5%. Yeah, great question. So the number here across the top is the um, percent missing. Okay. So 4.55 is like a 5% missing. Uh, and there's 22 columns, so that's about one column. Okay. So like one missing data point for that whole row. Uh, one person with 27%, two people with 68%, and one person with 86%. So these are our incompleters. We want to exclude them. So why I cannot seem to control the like how big it is? It just like kind of jumps back and forth. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> a code never seems large enough to me, but I'm also partially blind. So <laughs> how much data can I replace? Um, replace only things that make sense. Yes, let me finish the slide and then I will back up. Okay. So replace only things that make sense. Okay. Don't replace gender. Okay. So there are some characteristics about participants that certainly you can have um, a multiple imputation algorithm guess which one they should be. Probably not appropriate. Okay. Um, so try not to replace categorical data too much and replace as minimal as possible. Because for every data point you impute, you are making something up. Okay, it's a, it's a usually a well-educated guess, but we don't want to influence our analysis by making up a lot of data. Um, there are a lot of people who've said that 5% is a good rule. It has nothing to do with P less than 0 0.05, but um, there's just some, some simulations that kind of suggest that that will not um, impact the uh, analysis too much. 
And then we'll rate and replace based on the missingness type. So we won't do completely at random data, but I'm sorry, we won't do not random data, but we will do completely random data. Okay. So there was a question here about this table. Yes. So the way this prints out is the top row is the value from the table. So this is a frequency table. And so zero means no missing data. It's 0%. Okay. 4.55 is 5%. Okay. Approximate. I'm rounding up here. Uh, 27 is 27%. The number below it is the frequency count. So of my like 150 some odd participants, um, 130 of nine of them have no missing data. Okay. 15 have less than 5% missing data. And then these couple of stragglers quit taking the survey. It's just blank at the end. Yes? Perfect. Okay. So here's the Lego part. I'm going to take off the participants that have data that's missing more than 5%. Sometimes you want to be able to put them back together again, though, right? And so we want to basically create two mini data sets, okay? replace rows or people that I could replace their data. Okay? And I just named these a mnemonic that makes sense to me. You can come up with your own names. Okay? To do that, we're going to use a subset function. Um, this is kind of like dplyr's filter. Awesome, but this is base R. So uh, subset my no missing data set where missing that variable we saved is less than 5% okay. so it's gonna take off the four people who have too much missing data and then I'm gonna stick those four people down here in my no no replace rows and so I've broken I've cut the cake in half well it's not half thank goodness but um, I have a couple people that like I can't really replace them they have too much missing data I don't want to make up all of their data and then the rest of the data set that either isn't missing or only has one or two things missing now I want to fix the columns too so it's tempting to just go well each participant is only missing one or two items okay. so it's fine right no because Every once in a while, they're all missing the same one or two items. And so you're going to be making up a whole variable, which is no good. Okay. And so we want to also check for columns. Okay. Uh, great question. So the missing, oh, I got to back up one more slide. This missing vector is the same length as the data frame. And so it's almost like having another column, essentially. And so when I do the subset here, it just interprets the first missing spot as the first row in the data frame. And so it creates a list of true false. When you say missing less than or equal to five, it's like true false, true false, true false. And it interprets that in the same order as the rows. If these two things are different links, they will throw an error message, as far as I remember. Good question. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to do that whole thing again, but now we don't need missing anymore, so we're just going to overwrite it, but you can call them different things if you want. Um, only thing I've changed here, whoops, got excited, sorry, the name of the data frame. So I want to calculate this um, missingness based on the participants that are left. So I don't want to do this on the original data frame because I've already excluded some people that could bias my results. So I want to do this on the replace rows Lego block that I have. I want to change this now from rows to columns, so I switch to two. And then I can do the same kind of function. Um, all of these are less than 5%, so that's why the numbers are a lot smaller, because there's only 22 columns. So all of these are less than 5%. So I could do the same kind of subset. Subset doesn't work quite the same way when it comes to columns. I think um, if you're familiar with tidyverse, this would be select. Um, 
rather than filter. But I always just kind of look at these and figure out which column it is that's bad. And if you have 100 columns, there's probably a faster way. But in our case here, um, all of them are less than five. So I can replace this entire set, except I don't want to do categorical variables. So I'm going to say the columns that I can replace are these continuous variables. The columns that I shouldn't replace are my two categorical variables. Why that split? I know the two categorical ones are at the front. So I know they're column one and two, and I know the continuous ones are at the end. Uh, if your data frame isn't quite that neat, you kind of have to like piece together parts. Um, but I, it's just a habit of mine is always stick the categorical ones at the front. Okay, and you can reorder data frames to make that structure work for you. Um, now, my categorical columns don't have any missing data, but I'm just going to always, I always kind of separate them just so I don't accidentally replace something I shouldn't. All right. Now we're going to use the mice library. Okay. And so it's gloriously easy. This is what I love about mice. <laughs> so I am just going to run this little line here. Okay. So temporary no missing. Okay. So what mice does is it um, imputes the, um, pot pot the potential missing data point, okay. looking at rows and columns. So it finds the spot you know, kind of figures out, I think it's, um, it's chained equation. So it's, it's, I think it's a Markov model to replace that data point. And the cool thing about mice is that it replaces the data point matching the data type. So if the data is an integer, meaning it has no decimals, it will replace it with something that has no decimals, which is really nice. Okay, if it's um, numeric, meaning it does have decimals, okay, these are object types in R. Uh, it will pick a numeric value. If it's categorical, it will pick one of the categories. Okay. Uh, this is why you got to be careful, because <laughs> it will make something up for you that matches the rest of the data frame. Okay. All right, and what I can see here is it will come up with five, the default is five different data sets. Okay, so which iteration and which imputation it is. Uh, so that actually comes up to 25 different ones. And you can just see what um, columns got data imputed. Okay, and there's actually a way to pull out how many data points as well, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. Um, so what we've got here is these are all the columns that had a couple of missing data points that got estimated. But to get it back into our data frame that we're using, what we want to use is the complete function. The complete function has a bunch of different arguments. You can tell them to flatten, I believe, so you can average all the data frames together, right? Or um, if you don't do any other arguments, it picks the first one. Okay. So you could do complete uh, tip no miss comma and pick five. Uh, there are a bunch of options here, but just to kind of teach you the basics, it's complete. It fills in the data frame okay. uh, because tip no miss is like a bunch of of other stuff too. So it's got how many data points it filled in, what type of data it was, all of the data frames. So Tempnomis is not a data frame, it's a mice object. So we need to convert this back into you know, our traditional rows and columns. And that's what complete does. So I called it fixed columns because that's what it is. Now I gotta slap everything back together. So you dropped the Legos, you have to put them back together now. <laughs> So I first thing I want to do is I, I took apart the columns last, so I want to put them back together first. Okay. And so I put my no columns onto my fixed columns. So now I have my categorical data back with my fixed columns. Okay. And then if I want to, I can actually put my um, old rows back on as well. Okay. And so I'm kind of like re everything back together. So put together columns first, or um, Arbind will be very unhappy with you. Okay. So put together your columns, then put together the rows. Just to make sure I did this right, I just checked how many rows were in my node missing data frame. This is why I say things in multiple steps. 158, how many um, points are in my 
newly bind arc, all rows data frame, 158. Now, am I going to use all rows? Probably not for my analysis, because what will happen is those people with the missing data points will get dropped. Um, there are ways in SEM to do um, essentially what MICE is doing, but it doesn't. I, for me, it's it's a little difficult because it doesn't give me as much control right, over knowing what those values are. Uh, so I, I really like to estimate them first and then just use maximum likelihood, but there is what's called full information maximum likelihood. Um, in our structural equation models that we'll talk about where you could skip this my step personally I like doing it at the front because I know what's happened right with full information max likelihood you don't totally know what's happening in the background okay. so your question over here which is the no rows objects so no rows is our participants who had more than 5% of missing data and so it's no replace don't replace these rows because they had missing um, not at random so we want to like kind of leave them out um, I'm actually not going to use them anymore because they have enough missing data that they're not useful for my analysis sure so what you're going to see me do here in a minute is use all columns and not all rows but it does help if you need to like if you want to use all of the rows you can all right, so that's missing data. On to outliers. Let's run part three. So there are multiple types of outliers. Uh, I said this lecture, just so that we didn't go on for two lectures, is only about what is a traditional for sim. And structural equation models have lots of variables. That's the whole point, right? Maybe you have like four as a minimum, but generally the more variables, I hate to say more is better, <laughs> But that's often how people treat these models. And so um, with lots of variables, the potential for some weird combinations exists. And so a multivariate outlier is a, a row of data. I'm going to call this mostly participants, given my social science background. But you can think about this as an observation row, right? Um, who have a weird pattern of scores when compared to kind of the average set of scores. And this is actually how they, um, there's a really cool free economics, like early free economics on um, catching cheaters that they were doing something more sophisticated than this, but that basic idea of like, it's really unusual for a certain pattern of answers to come up over and over and over again. Cause it's a little bit of how plagiarism detection works as well is that like some patterns are, are are unique enough that they shouldn't happen over and over again and what we're doing is we're finding patterns that are just kind of weird and by weird what i'm going to define this as is mahalanobis distance and so we'll calculate mahalanobis distance for each participant each row and this is why i'm not going to use the no rows data or the all rows data is because if they don't have all the data points they can't get the score and so at this point, they're not useful to me. I can't tell if they're an outlier or not because they don't have a complete data set. Now, Mahalanobis distance usually is denoted by uppercase D. Okay, and what it is is it's very similar to Euclidean distance. You calculate the average of the averages. So the kind of, it's called the centroid, the average column, the average, the mean of the column means. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't get that out. So it's the mean of the means in um, multi-D space. Okay. So we have like the middle. Okay. The easiest way to think about this is a map. And so uh, let's say we're trying to figure out um, how long something should take to get from Harrisburg, right? So I have not been to work <laughs> in months at this point. And there's a really great distillery in Harrisburg. So like how long should it take for them to ship me some things right and so that is our centroid or location harrisburg is in the middle of the state and what it does is it calculates how long how far away things are in sort of euclidean distance space so in 3d space you know it's like 
um, the the flying distance, I suppose. But since this is a distillery, it's gonna actually go uh, up and then over down the highway, right, to me. And so you're calculating that um, hypotenuse, right? The straight distance from this row to the main of the means, right? So if it was going to Philly, it would be one thing. If it's going to Allentown, it would be another. Pittsburgh, another way. Right? And so we can calculate all these distances. And so those distances um, are uh, chi-square distributed, meaning there's lots of very small values. And so chi-square is a distribution that's positive because distance has to be positive, right? It can't be negative. Um, and a distance score of zero means that they're exactly on the mean. They are the center of the center. Okay? The larger the distance score, the further away it is. So shipping costs increase as we get further away, right? Um, and so they're using distance as a measure to calculate shipping. Uh, where was I going with this? So, you know, there's going to be variations just because people are people. And so there's going to be these slight differences in the way they answered the survey. So how do I know what is weird? Right? And so this is based uh, like on the idea of patterns. Okay? And so someone whose scores are weird have a very strange pattern and their distance score will be large because they're kind of in multi-D space far away from everybody else. Okay. And so we'll use our strict screening criteria. So we'll use 0.001 to determine if they're an outlier. And since we know that these are chi-square distributed, we will use a chi-square distribution to do that. Okay. If you're like chi-square, what? That's fine. It's this idea of like, if I calculate a bunch of these distance scores and make a histogram, which distribution is it? Okay, it's chi-square. <clears throat> and then something that tends to confuse people is if you've taken traditional statistics course, the degrees of freedom for our cutoff score, so every cutoff score has an alpha value, which we're saying 001, and then degrees of freedom. Uh, in this particular instance, it's the number of columns, okay, the number of variables, not the number of observations because we're calculating this based on the centroid, which is calculated by the column means. And so it's based on the number of columns, not the number of people. Okay. And so uh, this is one thing that people tend to, to kind of miss on questions about what's the cutoff score based on. It's based on the number of variables because okay. we're so used to it being the number of rows. Okay. So let's see how that works practically. So in base R is a Mahalanova's function. I see you typing over there. I'll get to it when you when you um, get it typed out. Um, there it is. Okay, did we choose to use the columns because they were all missing less than five? In this instance, no. This score is always calculated on columns. Is that what you're asking? I think it is. So this score, this data, this um, distance measure is always calculated for, for each row. So each person gets a score, each observation gets a score uh, on the columns. So it calculates like the average of the averages and then figures out how far away their row is from our sort of average row. But it's always based on columns. <clears throat> it's just useful that our columns don't have too much missing data. All right, so in the function, the first thing you put in is the data frame. I'm using all columns here because all rows has missing data and I just don't, I don't want to deal with it, <laughs> right? So when the all rows data set, we combined our fixed rows back with our bad rows and I don't really need the bad rows. So I just went with all columns because I'm going to um, ignore those participants that quit the study halfway through. Now notice here that I have dropped. So this is a, a subsetting, um, a nice thing about R, you can do negative, and it will drop the first two columns. Now it doesn't delete them, okay? If you're used to Python, the drop function actually gets rid of them. Uh, this just temporarily ignores those two columns, okay? The Mahalanobis function will only take numeric data, 
Okay, so we're going to have to drop our factored columns. And so if you do it once, do it all the way through. So there are four places here you'd put that. So the first one is the data frame, only the contiguous data, the call means function, and then basically the same data frame, and the covariances function, same data frame. Now this will handle if there is missing data. At this point, I don't have any, but I left it in. Doesn't hurt. So that's how I'm going to calculate my Mahalanobis score. So I'll end up with a bunch of positive numbers. My cutoff score here is based on 1 minus alpha. And that's just because of the way this chi-square function works. So it's 1 minus alpha because of the way it does the distribution. It's finding that spot where anything past this point is somebody whose score is really weird. So this is the distance score that would be considered bad. And then also to calculate this, this Q chi-square, cutoff chi-square, is our degrees of freedom. So how many columns are going into this analysis? Okay, so be sure your column, your um, data frame here is the same all four times. So Mahal object is a column. I didn't add it to the data frame. If I wanted to add it to the data frame, I would do like all columns dollar sign Mahal. Uh, in this case, I've left it as a separate vector. It's a separate object in R. Let's see, is it open in here? No, but I can make it happen. One moment. Okay, so here's our environment, right? Um, Mahal is actually just a set of named values. Okay. And so it actually has what row number is the problem as well. So this first line here is what row it is. See how it's missing five because five is a participant that got excluded. And then it has their Mahalanobis score. It is similar to the missing array, exactly, yes. Um, in this case, I didn't stick it in the data frame because I don't want to use it later. I just want to use it right now. And so if I don't want it later, I'm not, I didn't put it in the data frame, but we can use it in a, in a way that sort of mimics having it in the data frame because it's the same length as the data frame. So it has 154 values and we're using all columns, right? Also is 154. All right, so we've got our Mahalanobis score and our cutoff. Cutoff score is one value. Okay, let's see what it is. I don't think I ever told it to print. Okay, 45. So anyone whose score, Mahalanobis score, is over 45 are people who are too far away for me to ship to. Okay, their score is weird. Okay. <clears throat> Those four rows are our no rows. So where did our four people go? Those are the four people whose data, it was missing too much data. Okay. They're included in all rows, but um, I can't calculate outliers for them, so I just am excluding them now. Okay, where are we at? Now, oh, I did tell it to print. Okay. So we'll come back to this question about do outliers really matter, but I can calculate a summary here. This is kind of like a table of missing values, but um, I want to know how many people's scores are less than the cutoff. So notice the direction here. And so what this tells me is how many are less than the cutoff. So why less? Well, it's because remember our cutoff score is where it's weird. We don't want people to be weird. We'd like to keep them in our data set. So anyone past the cutoff score is not a good score. Those people's scores are unusual and not bad. They're, um, they're outliers. They're things that we maybe don't want to include. So you want to keep that less than sign in the right direction. Okay. And it says 150 people are, 54 people are less than the cutoff, so I actually don't have any outliers in this data set because it's made up data. Okay. In real data sets you would have some, so they would be listed as false. And the reason I do it this way is because that's also how you should subset. Okay. And so I'm going to say subset my all columns data set 
where the Mahalanobis values are less than the cutoff. Because we don't want to keep people who are greater than the cutoff. Those scores are the weird scores. And back to my question at the top here. Do outliers really matter in a sim analysis? Depends. So most, um, most modeling requires large data sets, or it should have large data sets. I mean, there's no one holding you hostage in Levon, right, our, our package we're going to use, saying, no, you can't run this if you only have 50 data, data points. Someone somewhere should be like, uh, stop. <laughs> because uh, these models, since they're regression on steroids, you should have large data sets. Okay. And minimally, you need more rows than columns. Um, so if I have a really large data set, outlier impact decreases. It's what I always do here, and mostly because I'm writing academic papers, but this is useful in um, just regular data analysis too, is I will actually run my analysis with outliers and without and see what it's impacting. Because okay? maybe that tells me something interesting. In this case, it's the same. But this is why having two different data sets is handy. Because once we get to the running the actual analyses, we run one of them with no outliers and one of them with all columns, and we see, you know, compare those two models. So sometimes they matter. I would say with 154 people, if you had about five or six, that might matter. Um, with 3,000 people, you know, even 300 of them would not matter that much. Just depends. So we'll run some uh, models, and we'll do one of these as an example that has like 13,000 participants. And so about three, 400 of them were outliers and it didn't make a difference. And then I've had models where I've had 10 outliers and they made a big difference. So it just depends. All right, so that's step three. Step four is our assumptions. All right, so additivity is this assumption that each variable adds something to the model. And this is why a lot of, um, like algorithms will will penalize you for adding too much to a model right so ridge regression and lasso regression will do that for you where if you have 500 predictor columns it, it penalizes you for having that many right um sim doesn't do that it sort of does that kind of we'll get to that in a couple weeks um, but we want to meet the assumption of additivity where every column that we add or variable that we add actually adds something to the model. Okay, and why is that important? Basically, if you use the same variable twice, you lose power. In these particular models, though, we basically just don't want them to be exactly the same. Okay? So the problem is often called multicollinearity. Okay? But that's not the assumption. The assumption is additivity. The problem is multicollinearity. Okay? And Generally, this is like they can be correlated 0.999 and it'll run fine. Once you hit that they're perfectly correlated, you're going to get some weird error messages out of your analysis, and this is a quick way to make sure that this is not the problem. Okay. And this sort of happens when you're doing reverse coding. <laughs> we have totally done this, and it took us an unbelievable amount of time to figure out, unfortunately, was that we had, um, had reverse coded an item and left both of them in. So one of them was one to seven and the other one was seven to one. Well, those are perfectly correlated because they're just linear math transforms of each other. And it was like just blowing up our model. <laughs> like, what is happening? We finally went back. There were 300 variables in this data set. We finally, I like printed it and I looked at it in Excel and had Excel highlight and found this, found the problem. Um, but this is before I learned some cool new tricks. So we're going to have our make us a pretty correlation table. Um, so in general, sim, this is not a super huge problem, but you just want to make sure they're not perfectly correlated because that won't literally will not run. Okay. And so there's this cool package called core plot. Okay. And what it does is exactly how it sounds. It plots correlations. Oh, it's so amazing. Um, many more columns. It starts to become hard to read, but what you do is inside here is a correlation table. So you do the core function. This looks just like our cove, and call means that we did earlier, so no categorical variables. Okay. So you put in your data set, and then drop your categorical columns. Okay. Around that is core plot. Okay. 
this thing is so cool. Okay, the line down the middle, that's it correlated with itself, which should be one. Okay, if you don't get the um, identity line down, the matrix line down the middle, something's wrong. And then the dots in here are um, both sized and um, colored. So the larger the dot, the more, the closer it is to one, either way, and the blue ones are positive and the red ones are negative. And so what we really don't want to see is something where they're all very big and very dark. Okay. So no blue ones on the off diagonal, meaning not down the middle. Okay. Let me give you an example of one that's pretty uh, core plot, yeah. pretty dark. It's actually MT cars, it's a kind of famous MT cars data set. This would start to worry me. So uh, the dark blue dots down the middle, that's okay. But these darker red ones are starting to be getting close to problematic. Okay. Um, because those might be perfectly negatively correlated. And that would be problematic. That would be bad. So I would actually probably go in and calculate the correlation between weight and MPG, okay. which I could do as core T cars. I think it's like 0.8. MPG, MT cars. I don't like to live type because I cannot spell. Uh, wait, there we go. So it's negative 0.86. It's okay. Okay, that's below one, but it's pretty high. Um, in this case, this a model with both of these variables would run. It would be okay. Is this while you type? No? Okay. All right, so that's additivity. Okay. That's more of a check to make sure your data frame doesn't have um, things in it that it shouldn't. So the last couple of, of, of assumptions, we're going to do a little bit of setup here. Okay. And I have some videos that go like way in depth on why this setup is the way it is, but I'm going to give you the kind of brief version. We've talked a little bit about how Mahalanobis distance is chi-square distributed. Okay. So if I randomly make up a bunch of distances, they, they fall into this nice chi-square pattern. Okay. Where there are lots of things close to zero and very few things that are very far away. That same chi-square rule holds for residuals. So residuals are the difference between a predicted score and an actual score. Okay, this is a, a measure of our error. So in Political Week, we've been talking a lot about errors and how they don't put any margins of error on any of these uh, models that they do, and it makes me crazy. But it's this idea of, like, we're making a prediction, and our predictions are almost never perfect because it's only as good as the data we have, right? And so um, we have this, like, region of error. Residuals are this region of error, are also chi-square distributed. Lots of things close to zero, we hope, right? where we're getting close to the predictions, and further things, uh, less things that are further out, where we're getting it really, really, really wrong. Okay. That's what we're going to do to test all of our variables at once, to test multivariate assumptions, is we're going to make up a random variable. Okay, that's what this first line does. Okay. So our chi-square here is random variable, we want as many random numbers as we have in our data frame, so 154. Why okay. seven? It's supposedly American, like a traditional American lucky number, so seven. Why not? Um, any number bigger than two will give you enough variability for this to work. So this seven is not a hard and fast rule. Pick up, pick your favorite one. Okay. Um, so we're just made up a bunch of random numbers. I'm going to use uh, a linear model here and say, use all of my continuous data and predict that random variable. Okay, so I had to drop my categorical columns again. Okay, you actually don't have to in this step, but I know I'm not going to use them, so I did. Um, and so that's what this tilde dot means. Predict random variable with everything in the data set. And so that gives me all of my row, all of my columns predicting this random variable. 
So if I'm predicting a random variable, the residuals, the errors, should also be random. Okay, they should be chi-square distributed. So lots of small numbers, okay, um, and only a few numbers that are very, very far away. And so that's why we're using a random chi-square value of our random number. It's because it should match. Uh, here we go. These two are for the graph. So we're going to calculate our residuals. Okay, this R student here is our studentized residuals, and those are, those are standardized, meaning the z-scored. Okay, that gives us an easy way to interpret the, the pictures we're about to look at. And our fit values. So um, what is the predicted score? Well, the score shouldn't mean a whole lot. Okay, if I'm predicting a random variable, my predictions aren't going to be that great, but um, I'm going to compare that predicted value to... Uh, the error, the residual, and that should be normally distributed. Um, we'll get to that in just a second, and should have meet these assumptions. Okay. And then I z-score them to make my life easier, and I'll show you why in a second. Okay. So the residuals themselves should be um, uh, kind of chi-square distribution. But we're going to check them against a normal distribution, partially because we're z-scoring them. Okay? But it's this idea that there, this time there are negatives. Okay? So we're going to look at this against a, norma a normal chart, because we have some residuals that are too high and some that are too low. Okay? Um, versus chi-square, which is squared, right? and they're all positive. So these are not distance measures in the same way as Mahalanobis distance, but the original piece, it should be chi-square distributed, which is why we're doing um, chi-square is our random number here, but by the time that we've kind of worked through everything, it starts being normally distributed, the normal distribution and the chi-square distribution are related to each other, so we're just kind of transforming between them. And if you're like, what? Just go with me here. <laughs> we're going to make up data that matches what the assumption should be, and then look and see, does it match that assumption? Okay, I'm going to scroll out just a little bit here. So the first one we're going to test is linearity. Okay, linearity we can get directly from our fake model, our fake regression. And I put the word fake here because uh, if you have a real regression, you can actually do this on the real analysis. But we're running regression on regression with this data at the end, so we need kind of a fake one to, to mimic this process. And so we assume there's a multivariate relationship between the contiguous variables, so no categoricals, is linear. Okay, it's not curvilinear. linear. If it is curvilinear, that's actually okay. We can do something about it, but mostly we would prefer it not be. And there are many ways to test this. So you can look at, you know, um, lots of plots. But we're just going to use a QQ plot. People also use a QQ plot for a normality test. Um, I like a different plot for that. Uh, but what we want to see on a QQ plot, or sometimes called a PP plot, is this is a z-score down here at the bottom. And we want to see that most of the data is on the line, okay? meaning the theoretical place that these should these fall matches the actual standardized residual. Okay? And these standardized residuals should be random because we're predicting a random number. Okay? Um, between two and two. Okay? Once you get past two standard deviations, we're talking about values that are very unpredictable because they're pretty rare. And so anything past sort of two and two is just hope we get it right, but maybe not. And so, yeah, there are a couple of values out here that um, curve off of the line, and that's okay. So my rule is always be nice to linearity charts. Okay. If you squint at it and it looks like a line, it's probably fine. And I did not mean to rhyme that. So that's for your lucky night tonight. So um, between two and two are the dots on the line, pretty much. So I would say that this looks okay. Okay, so when you're asked to interpret one of these graphs, look between two and two, say, you know, most of these dots are on the line. So it looks fine. It will help me a lot when I'm scoring your, your big assignments if you don't just say yes. <laughs> yes, meets the assumption. I don't know if you know that it does. Like, tell me how you know it meets the assumption, right? So most of the dots are on the line. So yes, it meets the assumption. All right, normality okay, um, is that we expect our residuals to be normally distributed because we have positives and negatives. If we only have positives, it would be chi-square. Okay. 
Um, not that the sample is normally distributed. Okay. So a lot of times this normality assumption is um, misrepresented as the sample has to be normal, which is actually not true. It's the sampling distribution. But in our case, we're actually testing the residuals. So the residuals should be normally distributed. Okay. And generally, most of our sim analyses are going to have large sample sizes, over 100. Okay. And that actually buffers against any deviations from normal. Okay, this is part of the, the idea of the central limit theorem and the sampling distributions and those kind of um, lar law, large numbers, that thing. Um, and so the larger the sample size, the sort of less this matters. So the, the code is really easy. It's a histogram of our standardized residuals. Okay, and they're standardized, which makes life easy because I can use the same rule. Okay. I can use between two and two is most of the data centered over zero okay, between two and two. Okay. We do have a little bit of a tail out here. We didn't have any outliers, so it's kind of interesting. We have a little bit of a tail. And there's maybe a little bit of skew. Okay, so when it's not normal, it's skewed. And I say there's a little bit of skew because it's a little bit leans more towards the left. Okay. So there's a little bit more on the left side of zero than on the right. Okay. Again, does it look mostly like a bell curve? Yep, it's probably fine. So is most of the data between two and two centered over zero? Yep, we're good. There are tests for this, but the eyeball test works pretty well. Okay. Last but not least, two more assumptions taken together, homogeneity and homoscedasticity. So the homo here part meaning equal, geneity and scedasticity meaning different types of variance. So this is the equal variance assumption um, about equality of variances. Most people talk about homogeneity when we're talking about things like t-tests and ANOVAs, meaning each group has an equal variance because ANOVA is analysis of variance. So we want to make sure that the variances are roughly equal. Here, we're mostly talking about um, homoscedasticity, which is the equality and the spread of the variance. And there are a couple of plots that are already built into the linear model that we've done, but I don't love them. So I always tell it to plot the standardized res um, residuals against the fit values. And you can flip these. It doesn't matter what order you put them in. Add a vertical line of zero, add a horizontal line of zero. Okay. And so when you do this in Markdown, you have to uh, include these little curly brackets so it does it all at once. All right, now this plot's maybe not so great. <laughs> What's this one dot, man? This one dot out here, he's causing us problems. Okay. So the same rule applies. We've been using this rule between two and two because these are standardized, these are z-scores, it's nice. The reason, that we, the reason that we did this standardization is because it makes the rule pretty simple. Between two and two are the dots evenly spread. Okay. So I'm going to look across and down. Okay. And generally, uh, yes. Okay, so there's what, what you'll see sometimes is if the plot over here runs from two to six, that's problematic. So like the bottom here runs from negative one to five. It's just one dot, really. But negative one to three is kind of a a wider spread because okay, there's more dots here on the right than on the left. Okay. Um, so across and what's the other way? Up and down. So this way looks pretty even. It's between two and two and it's pretty evenly spread. Okay, so you don't want a whole bunch of dots um, below zero or a whole bunch of dots around zero. So we're looking around zero here. That's the important part. So the spread around zero, mostly even. And then this graph, I'd say yes, we have this one obnoxious thing out here. Um, it may be this way, it's not totally even, right? So it's a bit lopsided vertically. No, horizontally. But uh, I probably wouldn't freak out too much this. Okay, that's homogeneity. Homoscedasticity, you ignore the lines and you think about the, the shape of the dots. So what you want to see is just a roughly blobbish shape, okay? meaning that the dots make this kind of like just blob. Okay? They don't make triangles. 
that would be that. Or rainbows, like this kind of curved shape, that would be nonlinearity. Okay, you would see that in both plots. Okay. Uh, what else? UFOs are bad, so where the dots are bigger in the middle and shoot, like taper off. Uh, and megaphones, these kind of like, they start small on one end and get larger on another end. It's also bad. Okay, let's just actually Google this real quick. I feel like this is easier. if you see some images, right? So heteroscedasticity, this one's one of the best, right? So homoscedasticity is where it's evenly spread across, whereas heteroscedasticity, you see you get this like kind of triangle megaphone cheerleader shape. That would be bad. Uh, you can see that in this, well, that plot's tiny. This one's a really good example where the dots spread out further. Okay. <clears throat> Should be there be no apparent pattern? Yes. That's a great way to put it, actually. How did we end up on 13? How did I go back that far? I don't know what I'm doing. Here we go. Um, yeah, that would be a good way to put it. Uh, that there's no... This is a different picture. I've gone back to my previous one, and that's a point I wanted to make. So this is an accident, but this is a good point. Um, no shapes to the data. Okay. Uh, I used to have a graduate class where I made them like draw me for a funny picture what they thought the data looked like and I have one that is very memorable that the guy like made it into Chuck Norris because it had this sort of like kick like random set of dots that went out to the side. It was amazing. Um, but no patterns, yes. So this one actually looks pretty good. And the one that we had up a minute ago, whatever screen that was in, also looks pretty good. This one, this window. Um, so notice between my two runs, right, so this is the original run, okay, where it runs from two to three, two to two, right, and this is the new run, okay, they're a little different. Okay. And this is random. Okay. The prediction isn't changing, the, the numbers in the data set, maybe a little bit because of mice, but not super, super big. Um, but the number we're predicting is random, so you will get slightly different runs. And so in that instance, I just tell people to run it a couple times. Okay. If they all look bad, you're in trouble. If there's just one that's like, like this one, where there's one dot out to the side, you're probably fine. Okay. So when I run these, I actually run it five or six times. Just kind of look, eh, it looks okay. No. For our assignments, you don't need to do that um, because we're just learning how to do this right now. But I would say this look mostly okay. It kind of looks like a fish to me. I'm getting like goldfish cracker vibes because of this um, shape of the little fins here. So this is like your like dory fish. Um, but generally this one looks pretty good. Okay, it's not too bad. Okay. On all of these assumptions, be nice to them like they've had a bad day. Okay, so don't get, there's nothing is um, super strict here. Because we want it to be really, really bad before we decide to do something. All right, so let me recap. We've completed data screening on the data set now. Okay. So it's not a ton of code, but there are a lot of like little quirks and ins and outs and rules, so you get to practice with a practice assignment. Okay. Any problems really should be noted, like when you're when you're working through these, you can be like, okay, there's 10 outliers, I got rid of them. Okay, it's a little nonlinear, but it should be okay, like that kind of stuff. And we will talk when we get into each specific analysis how to handle some of those.